Can everyone see this okay? So talking a little bit more about uh, file systems and file system permissions for a sec. If, we're, if you're sitting on the VM and you just fire up a terminal, you're going to be sitting in your home directory, which we just hit ls. Like I said, we'll see when we had that GUI up earlier, we're going to see the same files that we saw in that GUI, only now we're going to see them on the command line. Um, as Matt said, where we so pwd is a print working directory. It tells us where we actually are. We're in the home slash user folder. Uh, this is only because our username is user. If our username was Tom, this would be home slash Tom by default. But on the VM, the username is also user, so it's home slash user. This is where we're looking at. I mean, we can see if there's any other users on this machine, and there isn't. So if we do ls slash home, we'll see there's only the only user on this machine that has a folder is user. Um, so if we take a moment and if we so ls-l, which is the same as the ll command ll is just a shortcut for ls-l, uh, will give us some extra details on these files. So if we run an ls-l, we'll see a number of uh, a swath of metadata kind of going across the screen here. Uh, and what we're looking at is in this first column over on the left, this is telling us something about the files. In particular, it's telling us about most of these tell us about the file permissions. This first letter tells us whether it's a directory. So the D's for directories, that's the things in blue. So those are, there aren't really folders on Linux. We call them directories, but that's what you call folders on Windows. Um, so these are directories. The one that has a dash is just a regular file, and there's nothing else here. There's a few other special types. We may or may not get into them later, but the first letter, if it's a D, it's a directory. If it's a dash, it's a regular file. Um, the next, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the next nine letters are your permissions, which we'll come back to for a sec. Right next to that is, what's this for? Yeah, what's the, just the single number called? That's the number of symbolic characters. Okay. So have at least two All right. files. So we won't worry about this for now. Um, it kind of deals with some of the more advanced file system side of things. Next, you'll see the user that owns the file and the group that owns the file. So in Linux, every file has an owner. And the owner is a combined set of a user and a group. So all of your users, whenever you have a user on Linux, there's a user, but then the user is also members of, can be a member of one or more groups. By default, your user is always a member of a group that has the same name. So this is user, user, and group user. If we were looking, not at the VM, but at my machine, this would be user Andy and group Andy. Uh, now, you can also be, so your, the user isn't, you can be in more than one group. So if I'm maybe, if I'm working on a big lab machine and I'm part of a, I'm part of a research group, we might have a group for our research group. So this could be like the airplane research group, because that's what you guys do, right? Uh, <laughs> So this could be, it could be user, and then this here wouldn't say user, it would say like airplane group or something. Uh, if I were to remember that group, this kind of gives us, we'll loop back, but this gives us an easy way to start to share things with more than just one user. But by default, we're in my home directory. I have a set of files and directories. They're all owned by me, and they're all owned by my group. So it's user, user. Next to that, this here is telling us the file size and uh, bytes. We don't really need to worry too much about that. And then next to it is going to be the last modified date. Uh, so this is telling us when it was last updated. So coming back here to these permissions again, we already said the, the kind of core Unix, there's, there's some extensions to this, but uh, in core Unix terminology, when you talk about permissions, you're talking about essentially three things, or you talk about three different classes. So for every file, you have the owner, you have the owning user, so that's the same thing. For every file, you have the owning user, you have the owning group, and then you have everybody else that isn't in one of those first two categories. So with respect to each file, we can talk about these three groups. We can talk about the user that owns the file, we can talk about the group that owns the file, and we can talk about everyone else. All right? So that's essentially what we're looking at here. We're looking at three different fields with three bits in each, just repeated. So each of these fields has an R, a W, and an X. The R means it has permission to read, the W means it has permission to write, and the X means it has permission to execute, or to run it as a program. Uh, so not the X doesn't make sense on all files, because not all files are programs that you can run. But if it's a file that you can run, if it's an actual executable program, the X means you have permission to go ahead and run that file. 
So we see this RWX and we see it repeated three times. So RWX, RWX, RWX. The first group is, the first set of RWX is saying, what permissions does the owning user have? So this RWX corresponds to this user here. So in this case, the owner is user, and the owner has permissions to read, permissions to write, and permissions to execute the file. Make sense? Mm -hmm. The next group is then, or the next set is then the owning group. So the owning group in this case is also user, and anyone in the user group have permissions to read and to execute this file. They don't have permissions to write it. Uh, now, the permissions go with whoever you, you, it defaults to. In this case, I'm both a member of this user and this group. But because the user has write permissions, that takes precedent over the fact that the group doesn't. So it's not like I get blocked from write permissions because the user of the group doesn't. But if there was someone else in my group, so there was also Tom who was in the user group, Tom wouldn't be able to write this file. He'd only be able to read this file and execute it. So then this last set is everybody else. So for people that aren't in the user that aren't me and the people that aren't in my group, what permissions do they have for these files? And again, for this file, they have permission to read and the permission to execute. Um, if we come down here and look at this actual file, so on directories, execute means you have the permission to open the directory, essentially. Uh, that's kind of the one difference. But um, on directories, execute means you can open the directory. On files, execute means you can run the file as a program. So if we look down here at the one file, this is an example, so a desktop file, we'll see no one has the right to execute it because it's not a program. Um, so if you execute it, you're going to get a permission error. Questions on this? So this is a fairly powerful concept. Um, it's a little bit simple, but you can also do a lot with it by changing who's in what group and changing what the permissions are. One of the most common issues we'll run into on Linux is the permissions being wrong and it blocking you from doing something. So for example, uh, I need another, to make this demo work, I'm gonna need a, another user. So I'm gonna go ahead and do something as root. So root's a different user than user. Uh, so like Matt said earlier, the sudo command just means take whatever command I type next and run it as root. So I'm gonna go ahead, let me shrink my screen a little bit. Good question. Yeah, so I just wanted to clarify. So the first three in the RWX is the actual guy that's logged in right now. Uh, no, it's the owner of the file. The owner. So it corresponds to whoever's listed here. Okay. The next three are the group. The owning group. group. Uh huh. And so then the third one. Here. The third one is just everybody else that's on it. Right. So okay. everyone else on the system. Okay. So this is actually a little insecure. Uh, on a real, if you run like a big server, you would never give read permission in your own home directory to everyone else on the machine. Because while well, they can't change any of my files, I'm essentially saying anyone else who's on this server with, I mean, it's not a server, it's a VM, so it doesn't matter. But if this were a big server, anyone else on this server could essentially read my files right now. Um, that may actually not be entirely true. Uh, let me just look at. So if you do an ls-al, that actually lists all the files. I'm not gonna, we're not going to go into all of this. but. You'll notice that when I did the AL, I get the same printout, but now I have a whole bunch of other files and have dots in front of them. Uh, this is kind of like your hidden file in Windows terminology. There's really nothing special about it other than the ls command knows not to print out any files that have a dot in front of it unless you give the A, unless you tell it to print all. So there's nothing magical about putting a dot in front of it, but it does hide it from, it does hide that file from the default output. Um, so yeah, on this machine, anyone could read. I'm essentially giving anyone permission to read this folder. What I wanted to do is when you do ls-al, you also see two special files. You see a dot and you see a double dot. Uh, these files refer to the double dot means the directory above me and the dot means the directory I'm currently in. So these are like recursive links back into the rest of the file system. They'll become important when we start to use the command line to move through the file system. Um, but if we look at, we're looking at this directory itself, and even for my directory, the home directory itself, I'm giving everyone else read and execute permissions. So essentially anyone on this machine can read these files. If right here, if these had both been dashes, then even though these were read and executes, it wouldn't actually matter because no one would be able to open my folder to get to those and read them in the first place. So there are some idiosyncrasies to this. Going back to what I was gonna do a minute ago, if I want to demonstrate so let's demonstrate what happens when I have a file that's not owned by me that I don't have permissions on.
Okay, so I'm going to create a new file. So touch is the create file command. Um, so I'm going to do sudo touch, and we're just going to type in the name of the file. So this is, call this file private, because that automatically means everyone wants to open it. And the touch private is kind of a funny command. <laughs> Um, so if we run ls dash, uh, if we run ls dash l again, and we look at this private file, we'll see. Well, now it's no longer owned by me and my group. It's owned by root, and it's owned by the root group. And if we look at the default permissions, everyone still has permissions to read it, but only root can write it. So let's go ahead and make it so that everyone can't read it. Let's make it so just root can read it. So chmod is the command on Linux that lets you change file permissions. Um, because it's root, I'm going to have to run this as its own by. So the only person that can change the permissions on the file is the owner of the file. So I would get a permissions error if I just try to make a look at that. So let's say, OK, I want to go and change this. So I'm going to do chmod. And actually, the second argument to chmod before the name of the file is what permissions you want to set. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. The way you most often see it typed is something like uh, something like this. So what you'll see is you're going to see a group of three numbers. Uh, each of these numbers corresponds to one of these three fields. So this is the first, this is the owner field, this is the group field, and this is the everyone else field again. What these numbers actually turn into are, if we treat these each as one bit, these numbers are the decimal representation of these bits in binary. So if you're not quick at converting between binary and decimal in your head, this can be a little bit confusing, but six in binary is 110. So if we think 110, that's going to mean read permission, write permission, no execute. Zero in binary is all zeros, so that's going to mean no permissions here, zero for everybody, no permissions here. Uh, you can also do this by like saying plus R or plus RW, and you can change it more symbolically. But if you're reading through someone's instructions, more often than not, this is how you see chmod done. Because once you get used to it, it it's terribly confusing if you're not used to it, but it's super fast if you are. So that's the way everyone ends up doing it. So what I'm going to do is I'm essentially saying take permissions on private, give root permission to read and write it, and give everyone else permission to do nothing with it. OK? So if I run these commands, and then I do ls again, yeah. oh, operation. So if we look back up here, we'll see this change permissions private operation not permitted. Because I don't own the private file, root owns it. It wouldn't be very secure if anyone could just change anyone else's permissions on a whim. So what I actually need to do is, because I created this with sudo, I also need to change the permissions with sudo. So I'm going to run that last command again. Now let's look at it. So now if we look at private, we'll see I've essentially revoked the read permission for people in my group, and I've revoked it for everyone else. So now if me, just as the regular user, so not using sudo, if I just go try to read that file, so cat just takes the file and puts it to the screen, so if I go to read it, I get a permission denied error uh, because I'm not root, I don't have permission. Now, if root goes to read it, so if I do sudo cat, then it go ahead and completes successfully. The file's empty, so it's not printing anything out, but at least it's not giving me a permissions error. So we'll go into this in some more detail, but permissions errors are a thing. Uh, if you get them, there are, I mean, it is often just because something misconfigured or because you're trying to do something you shouldn't be. Um, but do know the command to change it, chmod, there are the concept of these three groups, the owner, the owning group, and everyone else. And each of those three groups can be assigned three different permissions, the permission to read, the permission to write, and the permission to execute. Make sense? It's OK if you don't commit this all to memory right now. It's something that you're going to be seeing a lot of. All right? What, what gives you permission to use sudo? Uh, so that's a configuration on the system. Uh, we can look at that later. If you log into like a ready, if you, so if you get time on someone else's like research server, you're probably not going to be able to run sudo uh, because it would allow you to screw things up pretty quickly. There's a special file that the administrator of the machine or whoever has the actual root password can go and say these users are allowed to run sudo. Um, by default on the VM, there's only one user, so it's the administrator user, so it has the right to use sudo. But that's not a universal guarantee. If you're on a shared server, you would never really need to use sudo because some administrator would have set everything up, up for you property, and the only things you'll be allowed to do is the only stuff that you need to do. So yeah, uh, this is an administrator property of the system. So everything in Linux is a file, and uh, every file has a permission level. 
Yes. I assume that you have a folder, a directory, has a strict permission, very strict. And then all the files under it are going to be strict also. So by default, permissions aren't inherited. So like if I go and change permissions on a folder, it doesn't automatically change the permissions on the files in the folder. Okay. But if I do something like go to a folder, I mean we can demonstrate that real quick. So mkdir is the command to make an empty directory. So make directory. Uh, so <coughs> let's do, uh, I'm going to do sudo make directory and we're going to call it a directory. So now if we look at this directory. Um, Oh, because it's going into the directory. So if we look at this private directory, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we look at this private directory now, we'll see it's owned by root. Everyone has permissions to read it. Everyone has permissions to execute it. So now let's put a file in that directory. So I'm going to also, as root, I'm going to touch a file. And we'll call it my file. So uh, I'm using local paths here, which is why there's no leading slash. So this just means relative to my current position in the file system, go into the private directory, name the file my file. Okay, so now if I list out that directory again, it has one file inside of it that everyone's allowed to read. So now let's say, well, I, want, I don't want everyone to necessarily read this file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go make it so everyone can't read. So I, let's change the permissions on the directory, OK? Mm -hmm. So right now I can read that file just as my normal user. I can go to private directory. I can. So I don't get any errors if I try to read it right now. Mm -hmm. um, if I go and change the directory, so I need to be root because root's the owner. So I'm going to do chmod. I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Uh, only this time I'm going to do 700 because it's a directory. I want them to be able to execute it as well, meaning that they can actually open it. But I'm going to basically take away everyone's permissions that isn't root to use this directory. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So now if we look at, good. So now if I go to try to list what's inside the directory, I get a permissions error. But what we, we didn't actually change the permissions for what was in the directory. The file inside the directory, everyone still has the right to read. But because in order to read it, I need to open the directory it's in, and I no longer have the right to open that directory, I've effectively blocked access to all of these files, even though we didn't actually go through and recurse the permissions on all the files. So the permissions add up. Right? Yeah. Um, well, kind of. So there's a slight difference between read on a directory and execute on a directory. Execute on a directory means you can go into it and read means you can see the files. So you can actually have a file very deep inside a directory that you can't know that's there because nobody has read permissions on, on the directory before it. Mm -hmm. But you can actually uh, view if you know that it's there and exactly what its name is. Um, so oh, okay. in general, just think of R and X in the directory. Just think of them together. But you can do some tricky things by separating out what they actually mean. But the point is, when you change permissions on the directory, it doesn't automatically change the files inside of it. Yeah. And you often don't need it to. Because by blocking access at the directory level, even the files underneath of it, they can never get to, even if they could, even though they could read them if they could get to them. So people do actually criticize the Unix permission system as being easy to misconfigure. And there is some truth to that. Uh, and then there are, I mean, there are, you get into security research, you can debate back and forth on the wisdoms of the way this is done. But this right. is the way it was done. This is the way you'll have to deal with it. Questions? Oh, so since you still know that file is there, you can still open it? No. So look, that's what I just tried to do here. Oh, yeah. So I can't open it because in order to open the way the file system works, in order to open the file, I have to open the directory first because there's some metadata in the directory that actually tells me where on the disk that file is. So because I can't open the directory, I can't find out the information I need to know as to where to go on the disk to read the file. Because you don't have read access? Because I don't have, uh, in this case, because I don't have execute access. access. Well, what were you saying if you had read but not execute? So read on the directory means that you can list the files that are in the directory. Right. And execute means you can do stuff 
So it's it's the difference between oh, this. I mean, I don't have either, but if I had read permissions, I could list all the files, but I still wouldn't be able to cap that file. And so the opposite's also true. If I had execute, I could cap that file, but I wouldn't be able to actually yeah, read that's all what I was thinking. So, that, so that seems interesting to me. You can read them, but you can't execute them. I don't understand why. Don't you just have the... Oh, okay. Just like if you were to have, let's say, an application inside of there, and you were to give it read privileges but not execute privileges, is that possible? Or? Well, we're talking about directories okay. right now. Files, a lot of files on the computer are going to have read but not execute. Right. Yeah, the, the read and execute mean something kind of special with respect to directories mm -hmm. versus with respect to files. Um, and we'll touch, I mean, we can teach an entire class on just permissions. But don't worry too much about them other than to know that they exist and to know that they might be the cause of an issue you're having. Especially if you're getting permission to write mm -hmm. type stuff. Any other questions? So if you block the directory, there is no way to read the file? Okay, meaning, can you show it? So if I do what? If I block the directory, like I can't. So I can't read the file right now, right? Because I blocked the directory. So that's this. So cat's trying to read the file and it's not letting me. So as long as you block execute permissions on the directory, no one can re no one can access the files inside the directory. Uh, does Linux have any kind of smartness built in to stop you from like locking yourself out of a file? Like, uh, zero no, file? but it has a safety. Root can always do anything. Okay. So even if I take away the root permissions. Right? I'm not going to screw something up. Like triple zero, it's like <laughs> yeah, so it, yeah. So if the, I. Uh, the read of. So let's ch mod something to all zero. So now, even though it's meant to all zero, so I certainly can't read it, but sudo kind of bypasses the permission system. So when you're root, you can literally, like root, it doesn't even check. If you're root, it doesn't even check the permissions. So you could do something stupid like that, but. You can always get an administrator to fix it for you. And is sudo across all the different distributions, or is this just for? No, yeah. it's true across all the different distributions. It's, it's but in, right, unless you're an administrator on the system. So on the VM, you're going to have sudo access. On someone else's machine, you're not. But I mean, it's not like a specific command for. No. Yeah. No. It's it's you can do it on your Mac. Uh, it's, it's pretty unique. If you're on yeah. some server that you have to be working on, and it doesn't have sudo, you might need just su which actually logs you in as the other user. It's not like that express command that logs you in and does it. Uh, SU, well, that's it. Yeah. So if you run the SU command, so I use sudo to run the SU command, because that's how you do it on here. But it actually, you see it switched my user to root. Uh, so you can, this is how you would actually give the permissions. It's even less likely, though, that you could, I mean, if you don't control the system, the nice thing about sudo is you can lock it down. So you can say this person can use sudo, but like only on these files. Uh, and sometimes administrators will use that to give you more than nothing, to give you more than like just regular user permissions, but not to give you full control of the system. So. How you log back? Excellent. All right. What are we doing? All right. Well, that pretty much brings us to the end of our time. I was going to, in more depth, go over some of these command line arguments, but we can, some of these co commands, but we can bump it to next time. Um, we're going to go ahead, we'll, we'll try to keep a list of the commands we talk about in each session, put it on Google Docs, and send you guys all a link to it live. So, I mean, we're not going to go into great detail on what they all do because you can always use man. So, if you want to know more about the ls command, you would do man ls. And now you can read everything you would ever want to know about the ls command. When you're in a man page, you hit Q to exit. Sometimes that throws people because if you don't know how to exit, you're stuck in that man page forever. <laughs> um, if you want to know more about using the man pages, you can do man man. And that'll tell you everything you need to know about the man command <laughs> itself. So uh, the man pages are actually, and I mentioned this at the beginning, but this is actually one of the best things about Linux. It's completely self-documenting. So no matter what you're trying to do on the system, there is documentation on the system that's available that tells you how to do it. Uh, so do make ready use of it, but we'll at least put out a list of the commands so you can go back and run man on all of them if you want to learn more about what they do. So our next session is next Tuesday here, same time. We're going to try to, if I didn't screw anything up, this video will be online later. Um, if there are people that are having trouble with the VM or anyone that has extra questions, Matt and I can stick around for a little while now uh, and we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, we will pick up here again next week. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.